Hello, and welcome to The Scott Mize Show, a podcast focused on health, diet, bodybuilding, and philosophy. I interview experts, doctors, coaches, and N equals one case studies to answer your questions about improving health, achieving your best physique, and making sustainable progress. We'll cover topics from carnivore and ketogenic diets, to bodybuilding, to life philosophy, and everything in between. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash carnivorecast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient, evidence-based, and delicious. And get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. This is a quick disclaimer before we start the show. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said here should be taken as medical advice. And please consult with your physician before making any changes to your diet, exercise regime, or medications. Thank you, and on to the show. Nicholas the Statue Weir, at Nicholas John Weir on Instagram, is an IFBB Classic Physique Pro bodybuilder. He's been bodybuilding and coaching bodybuilders and lifestyle clients for over a decade and is incredibly knowledgeable on training, diet, and performance-enhancing drugs. Nick is a regular on Paul Barnett's Anabolic Bodybuilding Weekly Saturday Livestream and a guest on numerous bodybuilding shows on YouTube. He's the owner of Universal Performance Coaching, where he helps individuals reach their goals of competing, being healthier, and building muscle or losing body fat based on their unique goals, preferences, lifestyle, and history. Welcome to the show, Nick. Uh, thanks for having me. I will say one thing. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm not a pro. I'm not a pro yet. Uh, I'm oh, really? To be a pro. I yeah. thought you had your. Sorry. I thought you had your classic physique pro card. I'm sorry. My mistake. No, that's fine. If the the reason people mistake it, I think, is I actually won my class, but I came second in the overall. Oh, okay. So got yeah, it, it's it. an easy easy mistake. Well, if you're near in the states, you'd have it by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. They hand out don't they hand out pro cards sometimes to first and second in a they class? Do, they? Yeah, they're mm-hmm. reducing it this year at a bunch of the national shows. I know USA has announced that they're only doing class winners. Um, nice, but I think some of the e- quote unquote easier national shows like universe are still doing top two in a class. Uh, oh, so yeah, it's crazy. And we have five nationals. I learned recently. that's wild. I thought it was four, but we have five um, all the way from May to December. Wow. Yeah. Australia yeah. only has one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very different. So when did you start bodybuilding and, and what got you started? Yeah. So, uh, what got me started? That's a difficult one. It's hard to kind of, I suppose, isolate. Or there are a multitude of factors that kind of led me to bodybuilding in the end. But I began with powerlifting and I I wasn't truly passionate about that. I thought that I was, but I, I realized later on in life that I was just in denial the whole time. Uh, and it, it was evident when I looked back and I realized how inconsistent I was with my powerlifting. It just lacked the passion that I have for bodybuilding. And so um, I, I transitioned from powerlifting to bodybuilding around about, I want to say, three and a half years ago. Okay. That's when I decided to make that paradigm shift. And so I had, that was basically from the peak of my powerlifting career to basically going, all right, I'm going to start focusing on just training for hypertrophy now. Because in the past, I'd never really focused on training for hypertrophy. It was always, I, I was that powerlifter, the lazy guy that would walk in the gym, do his main lift skip his accessories and walk out the gym. <laughs> uh, and so I was never, yeah, I don't think I ever really got close to tapping into my potential to build tissue while I was powerlifting. So I would yeah. almost consider I got quite a lot of newbie gains when I first started training for bodybuilding that three and a half years ago. And yeah, that's basically what what led me on the direction to that. And did you just have less passion for powerlifting or was it an injury thing? What um, caused you to veer away from that? Yeah, so it was there was a couple of things. Uh, injuries were definitely a factor that played into it. Uh, I mean, by the point I decided to transition to bodybuilding, I'd accumulated, I want to say, about five minor injuries. I had uh, a tear in my teres major. I tore my adductor. Uh, I'd done a couple of minor pec tears. I dislocated my shoulder at one point. 
And wow. so there was a few a few things that kind of happened, and I, it definitely did kind of dull the flame a little bit going through those experiences. Although I'd say the biggest factor was just yeah, I, I lacked the passion. Uh, deep down, I wanted to be a bodybuilder, and deep down, I think I knew that. Although I just kind of suppressed it so much that I, I couldn't actually unpack it until I kind of took a step back later on. And it was kind of around that COVID period, I think, where a lot of people were doing self-reflection, where I came to realize, hey, you know what, I've got all this extra time on my hands. Why don't I kind of just like work through everything internally and see where I'm at? Like, am I really doing things that are in alignment with my best interests and my passions? And that was where I kind of, I guess, deconstructed it all and came to the conclusion, you know what, I actually need to pursue this bodybuilding thing sooner rather than later because I've already wasted a lot of time. And if I don't do this, I'm always going to be wondering and asking myself, what if? Because yeah. you don't, like, I'm sure you'd agree, you don't know if you're truly passionate about bodybuilding until you compete for the first time. Mm. Like, there, there's the difference between bodybuilding and being a bodybuilder. And once I competed, I realized, you know what, this is for me. Like, I I was ecstatic. I I loved every step of the process. And powerlifting, I cannot say the same for that. I dreaded half of the things involved. So yeah, that was a big determining factor. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just got done with my first show and it definitely confirmed for me. I love every single part of it. Um, yeah. Part of me was like, will I really like competing? And even as I started the prep, I was like, I'm not going to do this again. Um, but the closer I got to the show, the more and more I enjoyed it. Um, and the show itself was just unbelievable. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great point. I think a lot of people um, get into this and don't actually know if they like it before they compete. Definitely, definitely. I think it's a big common, I don't want to say flaw, but just a, a, a common dilemma people run into. They just, and that's why I always encourage people, if you've got the slightest bit of interest in something, pursue it and see yeah. how it unfolds because you, you're either going to come to the conclusion that you really enjoy it and like it, or you'll come to the other conclusion and realize that you actually don't like it as much as you thought. And mm. it was probably more of a, uh, a novelty. Yeah. yeah. That's great advice. And and what um, caused the move to Thailand and what's it been like for you? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, so basically the initial idea was we wanted a change of scenery. We hadn't, like my fiance and I, we hadn't traveled overseas together yet. I had the idea of wanting to go to Thailand. I've been toying with it for quite some time, honestly. The first time I thought about it was actually before my fiance and I met. And then I didn't really think about it much for quite some time after that. And then I just, I remember it was probably around toward the end of our contest prep, my fiance and I were prepping for the same shows last year in 2023, so early 2023. And I think it would have been around March, I'd say. I started thinking about it more and we, we spoke about the idea of potentially coming here after our prep. And then we just decided to kind of commit to it. It was a case of we wanted to change the scenery and somewhere that was going to be constructive in regards to pursuing bodybuilding still because we both wanted to pursue that. And there are only a few locations on our, I suppose, list of places to go that ticked those boxes and met the criteria. One of them was Dubai. The other one was here, Thailand. And I mean, another option was the UK uh, because my uh, fiance, Michaela, she is half English. So she'd oh. be able to get dual citizenship pretty much instantly. Me being Australian, part of the monarch, I'd be able to get dual citizenship pretty easily. So that was always an option in the back of our minds, although the current situation of the economy over there and, and a few other things kind of steered us away from doing that. And then it was a see the Thailand or Dubai. And I thought I've already got a, a, a good friend over here in Thailand. Why not come here? Uh, cool. It'd be a little bit more comfortable. He speaks Thai because he is Thai. So it's it's kind of like a, a easier option. So we went with that and we've enjoyed it. Cool. Cool. Um, and what's next? Where do you plan to move next and why? The, the long-term goal, I've spoken to Michaela about this a little bit, is the United States. It's just very yeah. difficult. If you're not a citizen, I I, yeah. I didn't realize how difficult it is. It's extremely difficult to get into the States. Stupid. Although that's, yeah, that's a long-term goal. Yeah. Why, why, why US? Oh, a number of reasons. I mean, the big one is, of course, it's kind of like the birthplace of bodybuilding. If you really look at it from a, 
a broad perspective. And on top of that too, I mean, I've got a lot of friends that I've made who live in the States now. I, I've i always felt comfortable there. I visited the States in 2015 when I used to do powerlifting. I went to world championships over there in Vegas that year. And yeah, it was just a, you know, when you go to a place and you just feel like you're at home instantly, that yeah. was how I felt when I went to America. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of downsides to the US, but <laughs> it's it's a really good place to live for bodybuilding. Um, yeah. And what's your next goal with with your competitive career? What are you aiming towards? What are you working towards? So currently I'm in my off season and I've been in my off season since my last show, which was uh, end of April last year. So I had one show, which was kind of mid April. And then the next one was two weeks later. So I had the qualifier. Then uh, it was a national show, a pro qualifier. I did both of those. And then, yeah, I've been in off season since then. The goal is to get to a respectable size for super heavyweights and then prep for my first open bodybuilding show. Uh, get get my pro card is the goal. And so I'm in no rush if I need to extend my off season a bit beyond the initially postulated timeline. I'm happy to do that if it means that I'm going to be able to bring a more complete package to the stage. But I've made some progress so far I'm happy with, although there's definitely a bit more room to, to go, I think. Uh, for somebody of my height, six foot, I think realistically, if you want to be competitive and super heavy, you probably want to be in respectable condition between 300 and 320 pounds in the off season a six foot tall, like for a super heavy competitive bodybuilder, I think by the time you prep down, that's usually the, the, the rule of thumb I've seen at least most, most uh, competitive guys in that category are yeah. around that kind of territory in their off season. So currently, I mean, I got to, what was it? 282 pounds. Uh, and that's the heaviest I've ever been in my life. The heaviest I'd ever been prior to my last contest prep was 240 pounds. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was, um, that was, yeah, what was it? Peak off season. I was higher in body fat than I am now and higher in body fat than I was at 282 pounds recently at 240 pounds back when wow. I did. Crazy. Yeah. So there's, there's a big, big jump up. And so I'm not used to feeling this heavy. Everything feels different. And that's, I think, something a lot of people don't realize. The, I suppose the impact being this big has on your, your life, like quality of life. There's a lot of positives, but there's a lot of drawbacks too. I mean, you walk down stairs, your feet ache, like you you struggle to breathe in your sleep. You feel sickly full most of the time, unless if you're in a, a mini cut or a dieting phase, cleaning up. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's basically where I'm at. I uh, just started a mini cut, actually. I'm a week and a half into it. I've dropped about 14 pounds so far. So a lot of initial water and then some body fat and things are slowly hardening up. But yeah, I'll run this for six weeks, another push. Hopefully I'll break 300 pounds in that and then maybe you look at a contest prep. Next trial do will probably be somewhere in the States or somewhere over here in uh, Southeast Asia. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, uh, that heat in Thailand is no joke too, <laughs> being that heavy, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no, that's that's actually a good point. That's probably one of the worst things. And it's funny you say that. My fiance has always been a fan of the hotter weather. I've always been a fan of colder weather, which... You're probably wondering why the bloody hell would I move to Thailand if I don't yeah. like hot weather? Yeah. That was the one drawback. And I thought to myself, you know what? Short-term sacrifice for a long-term gain. Yeah. It's a good quality of life over here. There's a lot of other positives. So yeah. I bit the bullet. But yeah, she's even sick of the weather over here now. She's wow. keen for cold weather. And I, I'd never thought I would hear her say that in my life. So yeah, it was kind of funny. Well, don't move to Vegas then. <laughs> if you, if yeah. States. Um, yeah, it was pretty hot there yeah yeah um the east coast is pretty great i'm biased obviously but um so up 40 pounds um and in leaner condition that's pretty incredible progress in that span of time what do you attribute that success to uh probably well one using more drugs <laughs> i'll yeah. be transparent i'm not going to beat around the bush so um, historically, all of my preps, even my last one, my total milligrams didn't exceed, even in peak week, 700 milligrams a week. 
Wow. So I've never, yeah, I've never used more than that until this off season. And I started this off season just over a gram, like 1.1 gram, 1.2 grams. And okay. so just the, I think the exposure to that amount of milligrams and it, it's still kind of, I guess, low by yeah. most like mainstream standards, but only for your sense. It, yeah. It's the most I'd ever used. Though. And I think that was a big factor. Also the, the food, uh, and just starting at the, the level of leanness I was at my last show, I kind of similar thing to what Paul did. I almost deliberately over dieted because I wanted to bring conditioning. My mm. first bodybuilding show I did in 2022 and my feedback was I had the exact look for classic at the time. Everything was amazing. I had this roundness, fullness physique was very balanced. Uh, however, I needed to come in a little bit harder. And I, I went ab- away from that, taking that constructive criticism on board. Although you know what it's like when you're dieting, you kind of get carried away sometimes. And I'm that person. You've got two schools of people who do bodybuilding, the guys that do more, they go above and beyond of what they're expected to do in prep. And if they've got 20 minutes of cardio, they'll do 30. They meant to eat 3,000 calories, they eat 2,700. I'm that kind of a guy. I'm not the one that'll kind of cheat on the diet or do less. I'll always kind of do what I need to do or like exceed expectations to my own detriment sometimes. And that's what happened in that prep. Mm. So I over dieted, but I got to an all time leanest state. And it was deliberate because I said to myself, I'm not competing unless if I'm the most shredded guy on stage, I don't care if I lose some muscle in the process, okay. I'll gain it back. Uh, and I just want to have strided glutes. And I was the, the most conditioned guy by far on stage at my most recent show. Bell's also the lightest. I'd lost a bit of tissue in the process. Yeah. Because I've got a fast metabolism and if you're familiar with that, like it's easy at the end of prep for it to just run away. And it just happened to me. Uh, my metabolism ran away on me and I, I wasn't having enough high days. So my body just, yeah, could not keep up. And when we tried to carve me up, like it just wasn't working because I, I was mm. so depleted, so run into the ground and my, my body was so diet fatigued. It wasn't really like the carbs weren't sticking. Yeah. So yeah, after my first show of the last season, the two weeks between it and the pro qualifier, it was just a case of almost unlimited high days. Just, and I came in, oh, it was a probably I'm trying to think of the equivalent in pounds, probably about like 14 pounds, 12 to 14 pounds heavier with the same conditioning wow. in two weeks. Yeah. Wow. So just filled out that much. And yeah, if I did gain a bit of body fat, it was so, so little or minuscule that it was not visible with the naked eye. Yeah. yeah, that's great. That's the way to do it. Um, and you mentioned uh, like some of the downsides of being this big. Um, and I wanted to, I uh, wanted to ask you this later, but what scares you the most about bodybuilding with regards to health? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would say, honestly, the thing that scares me the most is you, you can do all of this blood work and you can do all of these scans. You can stay on top of stuff as much as possible. However, there's no definitive way of determining whether or not you're going to fall victim to some sort of cardiovascular related issue or like kidney related issue. Yeah. Me personally, I'm probably a little bit more concerned about the kidney related issues because okay, kidneys. usually, yeah, usually it's like the, I, I find usually it's a kidney That'll go, the kidneys that'll go, then it'll be the liver and then it'll be the heart. So if you stay on top of the kidneys, managing blood pressure, that sort of thing, you kind of can prevent a lot of those other issues arising. Although as soon as I see a kidney marker, like say it's a statin C out of range, I, I'm onto that like a pack of balls. I'll, okay. I'll, I, don't, I don't care if I have to come back down to 200 milligrams of testosterone a week, I'll do whatever it takes to keep those markers in a good place. Uh, that's that's very important to me. I'd say the biggest thing that scares me is kidney related issues because okay. the liver's self regenerative, kidneys aren't, yeah. and once you screw your heart, that's usually indicative that everything else is messed up already. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. For me, it's definitely the neurodegenerative side. Um, mm-hmm. Alzheimer's runs in my family. I watched my grandfather go through it. It was really scary, um, and it's it's also the type of thing that you can't really measure. Um, and you don't really know how much damage you're doing. Um, so that's definitely the part that scares me the most. 
that's actually a good point. I, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up because my grandmother passed away after she suffered from dementia for about several years. Oh. And yeah, similar, similar neurodegenerative, uh, new, neurodegenerative disease, but different at the same time. Uh, although, yes, yeah, it, it is scary to think that you could actually lose your mind without realizing you've lost your mind. That's a bit, yeah. bit of a, yeah, wild thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so shifting back <laughs> on that no, no, note, no. <laughs> uh, so um, you talked a bit about your last show. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like placings, what you learned, the good and the bad of that prep um, and what, it, what it was like for you? Yeah, definitely. First of all, it was a, a quick prep. It was a last minute decision. My fiance was competing. So I thought to myself, well, actually girlfriend at the time, uh, I thought to myself, you know what? I'll, I'll prep for the show as well, but I'm not telling anybody. I didn't tell a single soul. I started prepping about nine weeks out. And so wow. I went from, yeah, I went from 242 pound to 195 pound in nine weeks. Uh, not, not wow. a good, uh, not a good move. I would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but basically I just, I was sick of eating at that point in the off season. I was like, you know what? I want to give this one good run. And if I don't go pro at this show, I'm going to move up to opens and I'm going to stop holding myself back with a weight limit. Mm. So yeah, I, I prepped, um, in terms of placings, the first show, the, the, uh, regional show, which was in mid April, I actually didn't place too well. I came in the most conditioned guy, although, like I said, because I was so tired, the physique was so run down, it wasn't able to basically carve up effectively. Okay. I, I came out looking really stringy, very lean, but very stringy and flat on stage. And I just got dwarfed by everybody on stage. And yeah, it wasn't a good experience. I still placed second in my class. I didn't win it though. The guy that beat me in my class uh, I, I, if, if somebody genuinely looked better than me and they beat me, I'd feel good. Although subjectively, and also based on the feedback from probably about 70% of the people watching the show, they were pretty confused and some were furious as to why I got beaten. And I was kind of in a similar boat after I kind of looked back at it, I guess you could say objectively, although it was my own fault at the same time. So I, I came in second in my class. I didn't get to go into the overall round as a result. And that was that. Two weeks later, I came back. I beat that guy. I beat every other guy that wasn't at the regional show, at the pro qualifier. I won my class. I went into the overall round. There were three guys that went into the overall round because there were three classes in my uh, classic physique. And yeah, I what was it. came second out of the three. So missed the pro card just by a bit. The guy who beat me and got his pro card though, he was very well deserving of it. Fantastic athlete, amazing physique, great structure. His name's Eman. He's, uh, he's in Melbourne in Australia. And yeah, he looked phenomenal. Oh. And I was so happy for him. I mean, I, I shook his hand, patted him on the back on stage and I was just over the moon for him. And I think that's, that's something that's really important. Like you need to kind of know how to accept uh a loss as much as you can accept a win in bodybuilding and know when it's like, it's just not your time. Like you, when you just, you're not the best, you need to know how to accept that and recognize. And I, I could recognize that the moment I walked out on the stage, I, I kind of knew in the back of my head, he was going to win. I said, this guy's got the better physique. He can pose better than me. He's, he's the winner, but I'm still going to give it my best and I'll be happy with whatever the outcome is. But yeah, what I learned, I'd say, is I learned that I can push myself a lot more than I realized. In my first contest prep, I got lean, but not lean enough. In that contest prep, I, I really dug. And I probably could have gone more if somebody told me to. Yeah, I realized that I could dig a lot more than I first thought that I could. And another thing that I suppose I learned was it's, it's not about what you can do, but what you can refrain from doing. I mean, a contest prep is pretty, a sim it's a pretty simple formula. You follow the diet, you do the training, you rest, 
you tick the boxes and you get the outcome. But I think there's more challenge and more obstacles that present themselves in the way of things that you have to avoid doing as opposed to things that you have to do. So it's like you can't go out with friends and do this sort of stuff while you, you're prepping. So you, it, it, it just basically gave me a new perspective on bodybuilding and the process itself. It's, it has more to do with being able to restrict yourself to these small selection of, of tasks and basically mm-hmm. just exclude everything else from life. And then on top of that too, uh, perspective is everything. I mean, you can look at it as, uh, I'm tired, this sucks, or you can look at it as this tiredness, this fatigue is an indicator that I'm getting close to my goal. So kind of yeah. just, I don't know, it was a lot of just reframing how I kind of perceived bodybuilding in the first place. And I think it just made me a, a better competitor as a result. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing the the mental shift that happens during contest prep. Um, mm-hmm. You grow so much as a person, even if you're checking all the boxes, doing thing, everything right, quote unquote, as an off-season bodybuilder, it, just, there's always more to uncover, I find. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's, it's just one of those things like you can... You can put a hundred percent effort into it, and you can just you can get it. You can get the outcome that you want, but you're never going to be happy. Like there's always yeah. that you're looking over the horizon. There's always something to improve, or there's always more body fat you think you can pull off from somewhere, or there's more tissue you can accrue to make the whole balance look better. Like there's yeah, and you were even holding yourself back from your weight limit back then when you're on 700 milligrams and basically in your first couple of years of bodybuilding. Yeah. So my first bodybuilding show. Yeah. Funny enough, I was it because my first bodybuilding show prior to that, I hadn't really used anything over TRT, like to be wow. honest. And so my first bodybuilding prep back in 2022, I I actually tried prepping in 2021 and then it got canceled due to the like restrictions around that yeah. time. And then I did it again. I prepped again for a 2022 show, early 2022. And for the majority of the prep, it was a 20-week prep. I think initially my weight was staying the same. Then it started climbing up about two pounds, three pounds a week consistently when we started escalating the doses. And mind you, again, like the escalating the doses, I mean, working up to like 500 to 600 milligrams a week of total gear. And it got to the point where I actually... I got to 107.5 kilo. So it's like in pounds, I think 235 pounds. My weight cap was 99.7 kilo. So I think just shy of 220 pounds. So I was was a good 15 pound over my weight cap. And I was at that point six weeks out and my weight had just been escalating at that point. And it was a real concern. We weren't sure if I was actually going to make my weight cap. And Came, come weigh-in time, I was actually too heavy. I had people stretch me out so I could gain an extra half an inch of height <laughs> and I weighed in. And yeah, but because I was panicking that day, I took a diuretic. I did heaps of things. I stressed out like crazy and it ruined my look the next day, even though I made weight. And it was a bit of a, a learning experience. And then, yeah, I, basically the next prep, the one that I did last year, I didn't want to run into that issue and I wanted to make sure I had striated glutes. I'd never had striated glutes in my life. So um, I was pretty much peeled my first show. I just didn't have the glute striations. And as a result, I just, I thought, because the guy who beat me and got his pro card that year had striated glutes, I needed those. That was missing link. And you can become very one-dimensional in your thinking when you're a bodybuilder, unfortunately, in a prep. And that's what I just hyper fixated on. But I didn't see glute striations deep enough. I, I, I had to dig more. And so that came into the whole over-dieting process and, because I took calories so low for me, like it was very low. I mean, I think I took my calories down to 2,100 or 2,000 calories for the end. I was doing an hour of cardio a day and it just, it just ripped the muscle off me toward the end. I, I made yeah. my weight cap, but by way too much. My weight cap was 99.7 kilo and I came in 88.7 kilo. Wow. Like so so I, I'm talking literally, I was, I was a good. 24 pound lighter than I was at my first bodybuilding show where I was arguably pretty much stage lean already. So it gives you, gives you a reference point as to how much I overdieted. It was wow. pretty ridiculous. That is crazy. Yeah. yeah I was going to ask how much 
you, how hard you have to diet and cardio for shows. Um, mm. Sounds like you don't exactly know because you overdid it. <laughs> yeah. First show, I did no cardio. I just had a step target, which some would argue is cardio. Yeah. I think my steps got up to 13, 12 or 13,000. I think it was 12,000 steps a day, actually. My calories never got below 3,000 my first prep, and I was pretty much stage lean. Wow. So I don't have to diet hard. Most of my contest prep was on about 4,000 calories a day in my first prep. And then I decided to start my second contest prep at like 2,400 for some reason. Don't ask me why. I just wanted striated glutes. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I was at 14,000 steps at the end of prep. And mm. I never got below like 3,400 calories. Um, yeah, so you've got a you got a fast metabolism. Yeah, and I'm a lot lighter than you too. <laughs> it was 190. Wow. I weighed in at 193 on show day. Uh, so, oh wow! Yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, well, it's good for dieting. It's not so great for off season. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not fun. Yeah. Um, what's your training approach, and how has that changed over the years? Yeah, so training approach initially. I was more of a, I don't want to say a, a hit camp guy. I did do more of a lower volume approach. I trained pretty close, if not too failure. Uh, although I just, the, the longevity in that style of training just doesn't exist for somebody who has a history of powerlifting and somebody who's, I suppose, been through the ring a little bit or been through the ring. On. So I, I, yeah, I started with, that kind of an approach and later adopted more of a higher volume approach, more of like an RP style to, to the training, I guess you could say. So yeah, initially more of a Dorian Yates style and then a bit of a shift probably around late 2022 to more of a, a higher volume approach. And it definitely served me well. I, I went from feeling achy and somewhat broken almost every other day to never feeling broken and, and just, having muscle soreness essentially. So that was good. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people find that when they switch um, from HIT to more volume. Um, and it seems like in, I've watched a lot of your training vlogs, which are excellent. People should check those out if, if they haven't oh, on YouTube. Um, appreciate that. A lot of times you have this, even when you're not doing like mile rep match sets, you have the same reps from set to set. Um, why do you do it that way versus having like a static RIR and going like 12, 10, eight? Mm, yeah. So the, the way, the way I find it is, I mean, most, most of the time, like you said, I'll, I'll still hit the same number of reps instead of, I don't know, seeing a bit of a, a decline in them. Um, despite it not being a my rep match set, I just, I just find it's better for recovery. Like I'm still falling within that proximity of effective reps, like within that one yeah. to three reps in reserve. Although I just find that it gives me a little bit more runway for the next session and mm -hmm. I'll progressively kind of push closer and closer. So at the beginning of your training block, like I'll leave a little bit more in the tank. So it gives me that runway cool. similar, similar to dieting. Like if you're dieting, you don't want to just start dieting on your lowest calories. Like where do you yeah. go from there? And yeah. that's the mentality I have with my training. So you start with a little bit more in the tank at the beginning of the block, and then progressively each week, you inch a little bit closer to that perceived level of failure. And you might even hit it, say, toward the end of the block. And that's totally fine because you're going to do either a bit of a volume reset or you'll do some sort of a deload, whether it be like a half week, a full week deload, or something more strategic, maybe like just a specific body part deload if only one muscle group sore. And then you just basically repeat the process and yeah i find the the extra conservative approach or just not yeah basically going to that true like one hour on every set just serves me well um yeah i can i can recover better if i push too much i i tend to shorten the duration of a mesocycle after i have deloads too frequently for my liking yeah makes sense yeah very logical um and what's it been like working with Leon, um, your coach from Physique Collective. I worked with Matt Strong, by the way, for about a year. Um, oh, nice. So Matt's same team. Yeah, he's excellent. Um, and I followed yeah. those guys for a long time. But how did you choose him as a coach and how, what's it been like working with him? Yeah, so it's, it's been great working with him. I mean, we're, we have a lot of similar views. We share a lot of similar views. 
We also have some opposing views, but we're both open-minded to, uh, I suppose, changing our perspective on matters in light of new research or in light of new information and data. So, I mean, I, I've, I like the fact that he is open-minded in that regard. He's not narrow-minded and closed off and thinks it's his way or the highway sort of thing. So it's a bit more collaborative than anything, which is good. And I think if you're a coach yourself or if you're somebody who has, say, a decade of experience, I mean, I started coaching in 2013, back when I, I first started like getting the power of, you know, I guess you could say. Uh, and I mean, having that level of experience, like you, you don't feel like you want to call the shots when you hire a coach, but you, you do think that you have something of value to offer. So it's good when you have a coach that will actually hear you out in that regard. Uh, so, I mean, he was always like that in the beginning. Uh, I approached him because honestly, I just, it wasn't so much to do with his coaching. Like I didn't really pay much attention to what he had achieved with other clients and stuff. It was more so a case of this guy seems like a genuine cool bloke. He's He's got a, a, a wife or like, yeah, he's got a partner and he's got a kid. Well, he didn't have a kid at the time, but he, he had a kid on the way. He seems yeah. like a, just a very well-rounded, balanced guy. And yeah. Somebody I could have a drink with at a bar and and get along with. And I think that's really important. I couldn't be coached by somebody who I didn't see on that kind of level. And it's not because I I view my coach as a friend or I I, I think a coach-client relationship is a friendship first and foremost, but rather I I couldn't let somebody call the shots if I thought they were a dickhead. Yeah. And he he definitely he definitely wasn't. He was the exact opposite of that. Yeah, they have so to have that's the same kind of, like values as you. Yeah, and I did admire the way his physique looked. I mean, I remember the first shot I saw of him. Uh, he actually was very Dorian esque. Uh, he it was like a black and white photo we posted years ago now, and it was he was doing a, a protein sped modified fast for his contest prep. So it was like a it was a five week contest prep, something ridiculous. Yeah, I remember short. that. Yeah, and I just thought that was wild. I, I had so much. I had so much respect for him doing that, and I, that was another reason. So, the the fact that he seemed to have good values seemed like a decent, like he was a decent human being. And then on top of that, too, he didn't just, I suppose, preach his methods. He practiced what he preached. Like he he worked just as hard as he perceivably coached people. So that was another green flag in my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then you had a recent post on Instagram that I wanted to talk about or story and let you ex- mm. expand upon. You're talking about the dropout rate of competitive bodybuilders you take on, why, and the difference between hiring a coach and a cheerleader and what makes a good athlete. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Yeah. So, I mean, <clears throat> when it comes to people who inquire about Qantas prep, if I had to put a number to it, this is just a guesstimation, statistically speaking. Say you have 10 people inquire about contest prep. For every 10 people, you probably have two or three people out of that 10 people that will actually see a contest prep through completely. And that's, that's if you're, like, you're lucky sometimes. I'm sure there's instances where the odds are higher, although that's what I've seen at least that for the most part. And... So a lot of people say they want to do a contest prep. And I think when push comes to shove and they realize how difficult the endeavor actually is, they realize that they're not cut out for it and they give up or they just don't have enough self-belief and they give up as a result of that, despite the fact that they do have the ability to see it through. They just basically sucked out for lack of a better term. And so that's, yeah, that's the big crux of the, the whole post. A lot of people who pursue bodybuilding, don't actually genuinely want to pursue it. They're just doing it because it's trendy or it's the in thing or their friends do it or they just thought, oh, I love training. Same reason why a lot of people get into coaching. Oh, I love training. I should be a personal trainer. No, no, you shouldn't. There's more to it than just enjoying training. Same thing with bodybuilding. There's more to bodybuilding than just enjoying training and following your diet plan. Like if that's all you're going off of to decide whether or not you should do a bodybuilding show, you should probably think about it just a little bit more. I'm not saying that to discourage people from competing, but rather just to be a little bit more realistic and a little bit more, I suppose, thought out with their their decision-making. Uh, and then when it comes to the whole cheerleader versus real coach debate, I mean, a lot of people hire coaches, I think, because they want that external validation. 
and they they're seeking somebody to to constantly compliment them and praise them, uh, compliment their physique, praise their hard work or their effort, even if it's not necessarily hard work, like you're just following your plan. Oh, good work. Like people want that pat on the back constantly. And I think it's warranted from time to time. If you actually go above and beyond and you do well, or say there's a certain period where maybe you're going through a rough patch and you just want that moral support, I can understand that. But then you've got those uh, attention whores, for lack of a better term. And they just they just want attention and praise all the time. Yeah. And if you want to be a bodybuilder, if you want to be an athlete, a competitor, you've got to realize that's not normally what you require. A lot of the time, people need to be told what they can improve upon, or what they aren't doing that needs to be done or what they could do better. And it's just one of those things. Like A lot of people can't handle constructive criticism. And if you can't handle it, you're not cut out for bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is a, a sport as much as people say it's a, it's not like it very much so is. I mean, the, the training, the approach to training, food, all that sort of stuff, it's very competitive and you need to be able to objectively approach it. You can't just approach it with emotion. And yeah, that's basically w- what I was getting out with that post. You get too many people come to you. They just say, I want to do bodybuilding. And then you, you say, oh yeah, look, you you're not lean enough. Well, they'll come to you, they'll say they want to be a pro. You look at them and you say, look, you've been training for five years. You don't have pro genetics. Like you, you don't have what it takes. And people can't handle that. Um, people are, are, are much softer these days, I think, and to their own detriment sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I see a lot of that. A lot of people um, looking for validation, not trusting the process, not trusting their coach, and not, just not, frankly, doing checking the boxes like they need to. Yeah. How has um, your approach to PEDs changed over time? Like, it sounds like you've very gradually increased your doses, but maybe another way of phrasing it is what are, what are like three big things you've learned from being around Kurt, Paul and others um, that have changed your mind? So the first one is people use a lot more than you think they use. Like I was always under the impression like when I first kind of got involved in that side of things that the, the doses were a lot lower, that the guys at the top were at the top mostly for their genetics and their hard work. And although that is very true, they were definitely underplaying and therefore undermining people that they were telling this to, their dosages. Yeah. So people use a lot more. Uh, and also the process is a lot simpler or like the 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 formula for a successful anabolic course is a lot simpler than people like to think it is. You don't need all these exotic compounds and you don't need Trestolone, you don't need ment, you don't need DHB, like what's worked and what's tried and true and has been so for decades is still the same. I mean, there's been no real major innovations in anabolic steroids since the conception of them in the early 1900s. And it's more just a case of we have the handful of effective compounds that everybody has historically used that they still use. And it's just a case of find the compounds that work well for you, that you tolerate in terms of side effects and that you get a good response from and just stick with those. Rinse and repeat. And same thing with diet. Find the foods that work for you. It's just it's really just finding what honestly works for you and the sense of yeah, the, the effects, side effect profile and going from there. Yep, absolutely. Um, and one thing, I, I'm not sure if you've talked about it, but either way, I'd like to get your take on it, which is the importance of having an identity outside of bodybuilding for when it gets taken away from you. I think a lot of people are singularly focused on bodybuilding and you need to be um, to be successful at it to a certain extent. But also having things outside of it can be really important for diversifying yourself as a person. And um, when it inevitably does go away, not feeling depressed, lost, et cetera. So curious to get your take on that. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think it's, I agree, it's something that needs to be thought about in the lead up to not only 
ending your bodybuilding career or endeavors, but also in the lead up to the peak of your bodybuilding career. I mean, the sooner you can plan and prepare for this, the better, and the less of a shock it will be when it's time to kind of pull the pin on it and throw the towel in and pursue something different. Uh, I think, yeah, like you said, too many people identify solely with being a bodybuilder. And then as soon as they're no longer a bodybuilder, they almost feel like they lack identity completely. Uh, I, I think it's important to have other hobbies and to, to also just reflect on who you were before you got into bodybuilding. If you if you didn't get into bodybuilding, say at the end of your your teenage years or the end of your childhood, then chances are you probably already had an identity prior to getting into bodybuilding. So that's a good place to fall back, I think. Uh, although I'd just say, yeah, have a have a different hobby, find something that you can develop an uh, interest in alongside bodybuilding, but then obviously just not put too much time into it until you hang the towel up in bodybuilding. Uh, yeah. f- for some people that might be doing triathlons, other people it might be playing badminton, I don't know. It could even be going to the, the local gaming store and playing Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons. Just finding another hobby and outlet that you can basically redirect all that time and energy that you're spending in bodybuilding towards because you're going to have this massive void once you finish bodybuilding because all we think about, you'd agree with me, is when's our next meal? When do we need to go train? When do we need to go to sleep and basically rinse and repeat the process? It's pretty a pretty kind of simple, repetitive process and that stuff takes up a lot of our mental capacity and a lot of our mental space and our time throughout the day. And as soon as we know about bodybuilding, we've got all of this time on our hands, this abundance of vacant real estate to basically spend. And if we don't have something to spend that time on, then we're going to be left thinking in our own minds. Like an idle mind is never a good thing, I don't think. Yeah. So finding, yeah, finding another hobby uh, and also just, I don't know, maybe trying to dive into some sort of business endeavor, but it, there needs to be something with uh, some level of progression to it. Uh, if there's no kind of sim- similar to like a career, like people find they'll just kind of get into a rut and maybe even lose their identity if they're just working in a nine to five job that has no room for progression over time, you can't move up in uh, job roles, then yeah. it's usually very difficult to kind of stay motivated and uh, in a good mental headspace so just finding that that hobby where you can improve over time and and level up is really good yeah when when do you think you'll be done with bodybuilding yeah that's that's a tough one i mean because i did start later than I, i'd like to uh I, i've told myself i've given myself a few constraints i guess and if i don't meet these constraints, then I'll hang the towel up at any point in time. But I get my pro card within the next two shows that I compete in. I'm going to hang the the towel up. And if I like two shows, I mean like two competitive seasons. So if I do a few shows, like yeah, it, but like if I if I can't do it in the next few years, which is essentially like the next two lot of shows, then I'm going to hang my towel up. And if I can't face top five at my first pro show, I don't have what it takes. That's the way I'll see it. And they're the two kind of like benchmarks. So like if I don't meet those, I'll stop bodybuilding. And then at the latest, I'd say probably 40 would be the the point that I'd definitely kind of, all right, it's time to hang the towel up. I don't I don't want to risk anything beyond that point uh, because there's too too much more to life. Like as much as I love bodybuilding, I do recognize and I acknowledge that there's so many more facets to life and I think it'd be a, a terrible waste for me to kind of throw all of that away on one endeavor or one pursuit. Um, especially when you're in a relationship and I'm sure you agree, like if you've got a significant other, you've got to consider them as well. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really important. Like bodybuilding is a very selfish sport. We're very selfish in what we do. And if we have a, a life partner who is actually accommodative in that whole endeavor and their understanding and they, they, stand by you while you go through that selfish pursuit and the least that you can do like the least you can offer to them is to hang the towel up when the risk vastly outweighs the rewards and so that's the way i said yeah yeah 
yeah, risk or cost just in terms of time and focus and energy. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a hundred percent on that. Uh, thankfully I have a really good relationship with my wife and we communicate very openly about it, but it's something that's always on my mind is like, what effect is this having on her? What would our life be like if I wasn't doing this? Um, yeah. I think if you're a good partner, you have to have those thoughts too. I think so too. Yeah. It's really important to be introspective like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you better and share some yeah. of your wisdom and experience with the listeners. Where can folks find you? And I'll have links to everything in the show notes too. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram uh, at Nicholas John Weir, N I C H O L A S J O H N W E I R. Uh, in, in there, I mean, my Instagram bio has links to my website and YouTube, whatnot. But you can also just search my name on YouTube. You'd find me that way. Uh, my website's Universal Performance Coaching. So, yeah, if you just search that, that'll come up. Cool. But yeah, that's yeah. pretty much where you can find me. Awesome. Definitely encourage people to follow Nick on Instagram, check out his YouTube channel. Amazing free content on there. Um, so thank you again, Nick. Really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it, mate. Thank you for listening to the show. You can find The Scott My Show on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please leave a comment, like, review, or share the podcast with your friends or followers. It helps more people find the show.